Hi, welcome to lesson 22C, theoretical probability. We've looked at uh, experimental probability in 22A, and we looked at uh, sample space yesterday in 22B. Uh, so now we're going to move on to a little bit more of the probability side of things um, with the theory, the theoretical side. So instead of us having to do experiments, we're just going to um, be able to look at the situations and be, be able to determine then what the theoretical probability would be or the, the likelihood of something going to occur by analyzing the situation. So if we have a, uh, a spinner of odd numbers, what we have here, we've got 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13. Um, we want to um, then determine what the equal or the, the probability would be of the spinner landing on any one of those numbers. So we can sort of see that it appears that each one of those sectors uh, is of equal size. So if we have uh, four on the top, four on the bottom, so we have about eight, well, exactly eight, uh, sections here. So the the likelihood or the probability of the spinner landing on any one of those numbers is 1 in 8. Uh, we can write it as 1 over 8. We could divide that, multiply by 100 to get 12.5%. Um, or we can um, just leave it as a decimal of 0 0.125. Those are all uh, valid ways of displaying the probability. So of course, it depends on what we're interested in, in finding. Um, and so if we wanted to find, uh, like it says here, and you know that the, the, the likelihood or the probability that the spinner would land on the 11, um, well, it's going there's only one 11, and there are eight um, equally sized sections here. So if the spinner lands on that 11, it's a one out of eight, the total eight possible. Uh, areas to land, one in eight probability, or one in eight likelihood. If we wanted to then uh, change things up a little bit and say, well, what are the the pro what's the probability of a two-digit number? And of course, they're all odd, so we can say we can further uh, specify and say two-digit odd number, but they're all odd anyways. Um, so a two-digit number while spinning the spinner. Well, there's three two-digit two-digit numbers. So it would be three out of eight would be that probability. Um, stating the fact that it also needs to be an odd number, in this case, is kind of redundant because we know they're all odd. But if there were some even numbers in here, suppose the numbers went from, um, I don't know, um, nine to 16 or something like that. Um, if that adds up, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, then, then it would be a different probability because there would be some odd and some even numbers in the spinner. Um, so then it would be necessary to say the two-digit odd number. Uh, but in this case, we just have to, uh, you know, determine the probability of a two-digit number since they're all odd. So in general, for an event um, of equally likely possible results, just like the spinner. Uh, the probability of A occurring if, if our event, uh, the, the experiment or the, the spinning of the, the arrow on the spinner is called an event. Um, the probability of event A occurring is the number of members of event A, so a two-digit number. There were three of them, uh, 11, 13, and 15. And so there's three members of event A out of the total number possible outcomes. In this case, we know there are eight sections there. So that's why it would be three over eight. So it's the number, the number of um, members of event A and over the number of the total number of outcomes, which is we we saw we call it the universal set, which is the total number of possible outcomes. Um, for any event, the probability satisfies that the, the probability is somewhere between zero and one, which we saw in section 22A uh, with the experimental probability, where on that number line, uh, the, the closer it is to zero, the less likely uh, it is to occur, and the closer it is to one, the more likely it is to occur. 
with one being it's definitely going to occur and zero meaning it absolutely cannot occur, just like it says right here. So we've got a basket, and I love, I love these scenarios because they're so real world. <laughs> yeah. We've got a basket, and it's containing three green, four yellow, and five blue tickets. Um, we want to determine the probability of getting these. So of course, we could do the experiment, but of course, it's, it's kind of redundant because we know that you know there's the total number um, is three plus four plus five. So the total number of tickets is 12. So the probability of getting a green ticket, and let's do this with the appropriate color. The probability of getting a green ticket, well, there's only three green tickets in there out of a total of 12. And then we can simplify that to one over four. So it's a one in four chance or one in four probability that we will withdraw a green ticket if we were to pull one out. And of course, it's always random. It's always randomly selected. Of course, maybe there's a cloth over top and you can't see inside, so you can't tell, or maybe you're blindfolded, so you can't tell what ticket you're grabbing. Okay, but it's always randomly selected. Um, the probability of getting a green or yellow. So green or yellow. That's not really going to show up too well, but okay. Green or yellow. So, and green or, when it says or, that means either uh, one or the other. And so we've got three green and four yellow. So if it's either green or yellow, there's seven um, chances or seven possibilities of grabbing a, a green or yellow ticket over the total of 12. And we can't simplify that, so we just leave that as seven over 12. Now, I guess you could divide it and get a decimal, but in this case, I'll just leave it <clears throat> in exact values as that seven over 12. Uh, the probability of getting an orange ticket. Where is my orange? Is this orange? Oh, there it is. Um, well, when we look up here, we see green, yellow, and blue. There are no orange tickets in the basket, so that probability is zero because it's not going to happen. And then the probability of getting a green, a yellow, uh, or a blue. We can put the blue there, the green, and the yellow. Uh, well, since there's only green, yellow, and blue tickets in uh, the basket, obviously one of those three colors will emerge. So it is a definite that we will select either a green or a yellow or a blue. So the probability in that case is one, meaning it is certain that we will withdraw one of those colors from the basket. Uh, complementary events. Unlike complementary, like, hey, you, you look very good today. Um, complementary events, written with an E there, um, of a set is written as A complement. So this is A complement. Um, and it consists of all the outcomes of the sample space, the sample space being all the different outcomes um, that are not in set A. Okay, so if, you, if we have all the outcomes in a box, Sample set A is here and A complement is over here. So it's it's either from set A or it's not. Okay, so either um, from set A or it's not. Okay, so it's one or the other. Um, so A complement are the outcomes in the sample space. Or, or the universal space that are not in set A. So for example, we're rolling a die. And remember, when you're rolling a single die, it's called a die. If it's plural, it's dice. Just so you know. Um, I'm a stickler for English as well. Uh, so A, if the sample space is 246, if we want to find 
um, or, or what, uh, what possibilities um, are in the complement of set A, well, that's whatever is not in set, in, what's never not in set A. So set A is two, four, and six. Therefore, what's not in set A is one, three, and five. Okay, so one, three, five is the complement to set A. If set B is one and two, then the complement of set B is three, four, five, and six. When we're um, dealing with uh, cutting a deck of cards, well, this can be um, a, a tricky word. Um, I, I remember actually I, I bought a deck of cards and I was trying to do some card tricks when I was a kid. And I just bought the cards. And then I was reading these instructions that said, cut the cards and do this. And so I asked my dad, I was like, dad, do I have to cut these cards? Like I was th imagining taking a pair of scissors and cutting up the cards. And then he explained to me what cutting the cards was, because otherwise <laughs> I would have cut up my brand new uh, deck of cards and I would not have, uh, <laughs> I would have had a good deck of cards to play with after that. Anyway, so here's a deck of cards face down uh, because we don't see uh, the value of, of each of the cards. And cutting a deck is when you um, sort of take off a, a certain amount or just a random a number of cards from the deck and you show uh, whatever card is is then um, showing, like the, the the next card. So you just turn it over, and that's cutting a deck, and you're showing um, uh, the card. So in this case, the, the the deck is cut, and a queen of hearts is cut. That's how we would say that. So for this um, experiment here, cutting deck a deck of cards, if A is a club is cut, then a complement is a club is not cut. Which means, now we know in um, cards, uh, we've got, uh, here's the club. Now again, I'm no artist. See, here's a club. Uh, and then we've got the spade. Uh, and then obviously we've got diamonds and hearts. Okay, so if a club is not cut, then that means that a spade, a diamond, or a heart is cut. Okay, um, and if a jack is cut, then B complement is uh, a jack is not cut. which means it could be ace, two, three, four, all the way up to 10, or queen and king. So any of those um, values besides a jack. Now the probability of a complementary event. So we notice that the complementary event is one of, you know, the event is whatever we set it as, and the complement of that is not what we just set that event to be. So um, if we have, you know, the complement of event of set A is not A. Um, and so the probability of either choosing A or not A, well, one of those things is going to have to happen. So um, the probability of event A plus the probability of not A is going to equal one. So it, one of those two events is going to happen. Okay. Um, if if we know that, well, which we do. Um, if you if you only have the choice of two uh, two events, and you want to find the complement of A, if you already know the probability of A, then you can just take the one minus uh, probability of A. We just subtract probability of A from both sides of this equation to isolate the probability of a complement. So what's the probability of cutting a club from a well-shuffled deck? Of course, well-shuffled, because it has to be random and all that. Um, uh, so the probability of a club, well, as I showed you before, um, there, is, there are four uh, suits in, in the deck of cards. And so there's, you know, clubs is one of those four uh, suits. 
Uh, so if you cut a club, the probability is one over four. Um, what's the probability of cutting anything but a club? So that would be um, the complement of that. So we could count them. We could say, okay, well, there's diamonds, hearts, and spades. So there's three out of the four. Or by using the complement, um, the complement of this, we'd say one minus, well, cutting a club is one over four. So one minus one over four is three over four. Okay, so the using this is using a complement. And this is uh, by counting, counting up the other, the other uh, suits that uh, we could have chosen. Uh, we can also use grids to find probabilities. Two-dimensional grids are a great way to um, visually represent uh, outcomes. If we're if we've got uh, two coins, coin A and coin B, um, obviously from coin a, we can get a head or a tail. Coin B, we can get a head or a tail. Uh, this, uh, this dot right here represents um, a tail from coin A and a tail from coin B. So that would be one of the four possible outcomes that could occur there. And this dot represents a tail from coin A, but a head from coin B. So that's another possible outcome when we toss two coins. Okay, so there's only four members in this sample space. A tail and a head, or a head and a head, tail and a tail, or a head and a tail. So here we have a, a two-dimensional grid, and we're looking at, we're going to be tossing a coin. Here's the coin. And of course, we can either have a head or a tail, or uh, we're going to be rolling a die. And the outcomes would be one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so where, they, where those grid lines intersect would be the sample space. So we could have a head and a one, a head and a two, a head and a three, a head and a four, et cetera, and a tail and a one or a tail and a two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's gonna be 12 outcomes, um, 12 possible outcomes that occur when we roll a die and toss a coin at the same time. So if we wanted to um, determine the probability of, of, of uh, tossing a head, well, we've got all these situations. So we got a head and a one, or a head and a two, head and a three, head and a four, head and a five, a head and a six. So we've got six possible um, outcomes of rolling a, or yeah, tossing a head out of 12 um, possible outcomes altogether. So basically it's one over two probability that we will toss a head, which kind of makes sense because the coin toss is one out of two. So tossing a coin and getting a head, the probability is one over two anyways, regardless what uh, the die rolls. Um, now here, we've got getting a tail and a five. So tail and a five. So in this case, when we say and, that means both. Okay, so it ha both have to occur. Um, and so, um, tail and a five. So tail and a five is right there. And we see that, um, sure, there are six, six possible outcomes where a tail could occur, but only one where it's a tail and a five. Okay, so it's just one over 12. And then the possibility of getting um, a tail or a five, Well, this means, just like I said before, either one or the other. And in this case, um, we can also include or both. Okay, so we can have um, 
either a tail <clears throat> or a five. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so we've got six possible outcomes of a tail, and then we've also got that possibility of a five as well. And actually, maybe I should change all of these to green then, just so it all matches. Uh, so then that means that we've got seven out of 12 probability of getting a tail or a five. Um, now we've got two square spinners. Um, like I said, I'm not an artist, but if we've got some sort of a, a cardboard sort of stock card or something, and we've got like a little handle on it, and then down here we've got a point, and um, the spinner is broken up into four sections, and they got numbers one, two, three, and four on the edges. Three is back here, and four is there. Um, but we've got two of those, and we twirl them simultaneously. And so we've got spinner, let's say spinner A, and we can have one, two, three, four as one of the outcomes. Uh, and we've also got spinner B. I prefer not to use numbers for the spinners because we've got numbers on the edges of each spinner. Uh, so we've got spinner B and also one, two, three, four. So we could have, for spinner B, we could have a one, and then from spinner A, it could be a one, a two, a three, or a four. Uh, if spinner B lands a two, spinner A could also land a one, two, three, or four. So if we count all the intersections of those, we're going to have 16 possible outcomes. So if we want a... Um, Uh, the probability of getting a three on each. Well, three on each, and sometimes the wording, you really have to pay attention to the wording because sometimes it can be a little tricky. Three on each, well, of course, in this case, it's not too bad. Um, so a three on the spinner B and three on spinner A, well, there's only one, one outcome that would occur in this case. So we got one in 16 probability that we got a three, um, on each spinner. Okay, so three on each um, basically means on both. And then um, three and a one, uh, we've got, well, a three and a one. So three and one. So it doesn't tell us in this case, which has the three and which has the one? Well, if it's a three and a one, then we've only got a couple of situations. If we have spinner A is a three and spinner one or B is a one. So oh, actually I'm gonna change that color. Um, so it could be a three on spinner A with a one on spinner B or it could be a three on spinner B and a one on spinner A. Okay, so in this case, there's only two out of 16 probability that that's going to occur, which is simplified to one over eight. Um, and an even result with each spinner. Okay, so this is with each again. Okay, that means both. So an even result would result in both spinners. Okay, so um, we've got maybe a spinner A gets a two, spinner B could get a two. If spinner A has a two, spinner B could have a four, or spinner A could have a four and spinner B could be a two. Spinner A could have a four and B could have a four. So that indicates that just a two, or sorry, an even result on each spinner so there's only, there's four out of 16 probability there, which simplifies to one over four.
And so now we have a little discussion. Uh, three children have been experimenting with a, a coin toss, um, and they're recording the outcomes. So they, they toss the coin 10 times and have recorded 10 tails. Before the 11th toss, Sally says, I'm not sure why she's saying no to begin with, but Sally says, no, it always has an equal chance of being head or a tail. The coin cannot remember what the outcomes have been. And I would like to add to that, Sally, um, with our, and let's finish off your quote there, um, that the coin has no um, knowledge of what is going to be either in the next. So whether it remembers the outcomes or not, um, we don't know what the, uh, the result's going to be. So what we're going to do is, um, uh, well, we have to like kind of think about what, um, uh, what she said and what the, what the results have been. And of course, there's no, there's no knowing of what the next spin is going to, or what next toss is going to be. Uh, Amy then says, well, I think it'll probably be a tail again because I think the coin must be biased. So it must be weighted. So it's more likely to be a tail. So, you know, Amy might think, okay, well, it's been 10 tails in a row. The likelihood of that is pretty rare. Um, and uh, Sally is saying, well, you know, it certainly could be a, a head next time because how do we know? So, um, if, if you want to kind of think about this for a little bit, I'm not going to, I mean, there's no real answer to this, but think about that situation and we can have a, a discussion in class next time we, we uh, meet together as a group. And thanks for watching and we'll see you in class.